Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the House Healthcare Committee. It's Thursday, May 13th, and it's nine in the morning. Uh, this morning, we are going to turn our attention again to uh, the issue of children in Vermont waiting in emergency room departments, which we've taken testimony about. We've uh, had committee discussion and uh, decided that given that it's the end of the session and um, how important this issue is, that we crafted a letter that we directed to uh, the agency human services, the Department of Mental Health, uh, to the Vermont Association for Hospitals and Health Systems, and the Agency of Education. Uh, and this morning, we invited folks to whom we had directed the letter to join us to uh, give us further comments. Uh, and I, I really appreciate uh, each of you uh, making the time to join us again this morning as we continue to work together to address this uh, critical issue uh, for children, families, receiving mental health services and uh, the issue of emergency room waits. So I'm going to, um, so I see that we have uh, the commissioner from the Department of Mental Health uh, and several of her staff. Uh, we have welcomed Heather um, Boucher from the Agency of Education and Devin Green and Emma Harrigan, again, from the from VOS. Uh, would it, I'm, I'm guessing, but I'm thinking I might turn turn first to the commissioner of mental health. Uh, does that does that make sense, Commissioner? Yes. Good morning. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you, Representative Lippert. Okay. Great. Well, let's let's um, let's begin by uh, turning to hear from the Commissioner of Mental Health and welcome you to have others uh, chime in along the way. We're interested in hearing from everyone involved. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Uh, for the record, Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health, joined here by my colleagues, um, Laurel Omland, who's our Director of Ch our Child, Youth and Family Division, and Dr. David Ratu, who is our Child Medical Director. Um, on behalf of the Agency of Human Services and the Department of Mental Health, I want to thank the committee um, for your attention to this urgent and important issue, um, for your thoughtfulness in the memo that was prepared. Um, we all recognize that um, children and youth waiting for extended periods of times in emergency departments is completely unacceptable. Um, it is not the appropriate setting to treat youth with psychiatric needs. Um, and it's a crisis point for them, the youth themselves, for their families. Um, and it's very difficult and frustrating for the providers um, who wanna help them access the necessary care that they need. As we presented in our previous testimony, um, this is a systemic issue. It does require a systemic response, which is why I was joined by my colleagues from AHS at our last testimony um, from the Department of Aging and Independent Living, Dale, DCF, and DIVA, really trying to underscore that it will require all of us and collective action um, to make meaningful change um, and to really implement many of the solutions that we've put forward. Um, I also really appreciate the committee's recognition and fully agree that our responses and solutions need to be holistic and integrated and considerate of all aspects of our continuum of care. I also appreciated that the memo articulated um, that the standing up of the Mental Health Integration Council uh, will be a great opportunity for us to really focus on this, have a laser focus on this as part of that council's work. Um, as I noted in my previous testimony, there are a lot of uh, factors that are contributing to this issue. Uh, we know even prior to COVID, we were seeing increased mental health needs due to COVID, particularly for this 12 to 17 age group. Uh, we have been sharing publicly at the governor's press conferences our concern about the state of mental health for youth in particular, and we know that public health emergencies have both short-term and long-term consequences for children and youth. Also, it is great to be joined here today uh, by leadership from the Agency of Education. We also recognize that our schools have not been fully reopened. We know that particularly for youth, child, children and youth receiving Medicaid, um, a large portion of those children and youth receive their services through their public schools. 
So having our public schools more fully reopened uh, will certainly create more access to services and supports. It's also going to be a moment where we will identify even more need. Um, and again, as I noted in previous testimony, we have had reduced capacity in our child and youth system of care, whether that's due to COVID precautions, whether that is due to residential and diversion capacity being reduced. Uh, I also noted that, you know, one of the contributing factors to this moment in time um, is that many of the youth uh, who are receiving services at the Brattleboro Retreat, which is our only inpatient provider for children and youth, were actually and continue to be ready for discharge, uh, but we lack the appropriate step-down options for them. So again, that all to be said to contextualize the issue. Also, I would just note that in talking to my counterpoints from other states, Vermont is certainly not alone in this. Um, I was speaking with my colleagues in Massachusetts yesterday. They have over 100 youth waiting in their EDs on a daily basis. I was speaking with her to try to get a sense of what solutions are you implementing? Um, many of them are very much aligned uh, with some of the suggestions that were in the memo, some of what we have put forward at the Agency of Human Services. Um, but again, um, I think there is an urgency here, um, not just something that Vermont is experiencing, um, but fellow states as well. Related to specifically to the memo that came from House Healthcare, um, I just wanted to highlight some of the areas um, and our response to them. I think that's probably something the committee is looking for today. Um, a couple of them in particular, um, which I really appreciated, was underscoring um, the need for input from families and peer stakeholders. Uh, I was actually going back to pre-pandemic uh, over a year and a half ago, um, we actually convened a group of stakeholders from across the state to address this very issue um, that was inclusive of the Vermont Federation for Families, um, families from across the state. Uh, and I think, you know, now is the time to reconvene that group. Uh, we heard loud and clear from families what their needs were, what the gaps were, what they maybe experienced a decade ago in terms of services and supports and what their experience has been now. It also really articulated the need, um, which we also I think could be embedded into the work of the council um, is the need for parity um, in terms of insurance payment, particularly for in-home services. We heard that loud and clear from families. Um, if they have a, you know, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, their ability to receive in-home services and supports looks very different. Um, so again, these are just pieces that we need to continue to look at. Um, there was a significant focus on data benchmarking and accountability in your memo, which I also think is appropriate, timely, um, and necessary. Um, if we're really looking to move the needle on this issue, then we need to know what our targets are. We need to know what our data is and that creates accountability, which is essential for improvements to the system of care. So the weekly reporting that was indicated, obviously that is something that VAS is, has already picked up the ball and is doing. Um, we need enhanced collaboration between VAS and the Department of Mental Health. I think one thing that has been clear is that we have access to certain pieces of data, VAS has access to certain pieces of data, and the two need to be um, integrated together so we get a full scope of the picture that is consistent um, so that, again, we can continue to address the scope of the issue. Uh, we met with VAS yesterday. We had a very productive discussion about how we intend to move that work forward together. Um, and again, the targeted benchmarking, I think, is also critical in terms of, you know, what are um, the wait times that we are looking for, um, if not zero, um, and then what are we setting for a goal and a date to achieve that. Um, also, there were some specifics in terms of looking at data by age, which I also think is something, um, according to my team, that we can do. Um, again, noting the Mental Health Integration Council, I fully agree that that is a great area and aspect for them to focus on. And then the accountability around the completed action steps um, was also a significant part of the memo. Um, I fully support that. Uh, the Department of Mental Health um, has a bit of a, a track record in this kind of accountability. Um, it reminds me a bit of the work that we did when we were implementing an action plan for sustainability for the Brattleboro Retreat, uh, which where there is a lot of reporting um, back to the legislature um, to document progress towards those action areas. Uh, so I think we are well poised um, to be responsive to that and to provide 
provide the kind of reporting um, back to the legislature that you are looking for. Um, so that's just, I think, a, a quick highlight and review of what was articulated um, in the memo, in addition to um, just the specific work uh, that can be done directly with the EDs um, in collaboration with VAS to make Im immediate improvements to the environment of care. Um, actually, that was one of the, the outcomes of the previous convening that I noted, um, where families really let us know the department that coming into the emergency department with a child or youth who's experienced a significant mental health crisis is completely overwhelming. Um, and it's hard to know where to begin, who to talk to, what are your options? Um, so we actually created um, a great brochure um, in collaboration with the Vermont Federation for Families that we distributed to all of the EDs. Um, we will be moving forward with uh, reprinting that and ensuring that there is adequate supply of that in the EDs. Again, that's just one example of, you know, some of the ways that we can immediately um, improve the environment of care and also ensure um, that families in particular um, have the supports that they need and the understanding that they need of the system because it is completely overwhelming and very complex to navigate. Um, I also just wanted to note that, of course, we have um, made incredible efforts to support our community mental health system of care and our largest inpatient provider. Um, I would just note um, that over the past year, um, given that the Brattleboro Retreat um, is the only provider of child and youth inpatient, um, we have successfully implemented that sustainability plan. Also just wanted to note um, that we were able to implement an alternative payment model with the Brattleboro Retreat that was actually implemented in April. Um, that is a huge accomplishment um, on behalf of the Agency of Human Services and the retreat um, creating significant fiscal stability for them, um, thus allowing them to maintain the essential capacity that we need. So I just wanted to note that for the committee. I don't know that we have specifically testified on that in the committee, but I wanted you to be aware um, that that was a big part of the sustainability plan that we were able to execute and implement successfully. Um, in terms of our action plan, I see a lot of alignment between um, some of the areas that we put forward in addition um, to the benchmarking and data pieces and other pieces that were noted um, in your memo. Um, I would also just note in addition to that, um, one of the things that Massachusetts is doing um, is looking at um, for children and youth who are boarding, if you will, that if it's appropriate, they could be admitted onto um, a pediatric unit to receive psychiatric consultation. Um, I'm very happy um, to report that UVMMC um, will be starting to do that effective Monday. Um, they are planning to um, have capacity for up to two child or youth uh, patients who would be appropriate um, to be placed on their general pediatric floor, and then they can receive appropriate psychiatric consultation um, from um, the, psych the child psychiatry team there at UVM while they're awaiting placement. So again, just another um, demonstration of the systematic efforts that are being made and um, a great thanks to UVMMC um, for their work on that. Um, I won't rehash um, all of the um, solutions that we put forward, but I do just wanna uh, remind the committee and note that we will have an incredible opportunity um, not only to implement, but scale up mobile response efforts across the state with the increased FMAP that will go into effect in April of 2022. That's an 85% FMAP. So that is huge for us as a state system as we move forward. Um, of course, it will, it will support um, not only the short-term implementation of mobile response, but if we really, again, want to make the kind of systemic change that we want to see, our ability to scale that up in a meaningful way will be significant. Um, we also heard from Diva and Dale and some of the work that they are doing, Dale in particular, who is um, putting out or has out an RFP for intensive transition supports, um, specifically for children and youth. I will note that some of our most complex cases in the system um, are those youth um, who have both complex mental health needs and developmental disability needs. Um, so that is something that we also need to continue to look at. 
And then I guess, uh, finally, the Agency of Education, um, grateful to have them join us here today. Um, I just wanted to talk about some of the collaboration and work that has been happening to date. Um, first and foremost, I would just note that last, gosh, uh, March or April, when we were um, grappling with the immediate throes of the pandemic and the crisis, um, we worked side by side with Secretary French and Deputy Secretary Boucher to ensure that the provision of school-based mental health services could continue even if delivered in a different format, more remotely. Um, there was quite a bit of work um, to ensure that our funding mechanisms would still align, that the local LEAs would be supportive and continuing to support these contracts. Um, so just that to underscore that that collaboration is ongoing um, and has been uh, really essential, particularly for the continued implementation of school-based mental health supports. Also the Agency of Education's um, recovery plan, um, they worked very closely with the Department of Mental Health um, to articulate and underscore um, that now more than ever, the fundamental building blocks of social and emotional competency and well-being are so critical. It's why one of the three legs of the stool of their recovery plan is solely focused on emotional functioning, mental health, and well-being, um, and their work to um, work with their local education agencies um, and really ensuring that there are significant targeted efforts that are focused in this area. Um, and really the recovery plan that the Agency of Education has put forward, I think clearly articulates that as children and youth return to school, attention needs to be paid to safety, structure, and reestablishing those strong and secure relationships. So I just wanna thank Heather and Dan for their leadership and partnership with us as they have moved that forward. The last piece I would just note in thinking about, you know, the table that's set, the size of the tent of the partners that need to come together um, to support this issue. I would just note that ADAP is another partner that I think um, we also need to include in this conversation. One of the factors that we are beginning to recognize um, that is driving some of the mental health challenges, particularly for youth and young adults, is substance use especially cannabis. Uh, so again, I just note that is something that we need to keep our eye on. Um, after years of stability, we saw the first statistically significant increase in rates of Vermont youth cannabis use as part of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey in 2019. I can't say that we have um, uh, truly systemic data on this, but we are starting to recognize that a high proportion of involuntary hospitalization of adolescents and young adults are occurring among individuals with significant cannabis use. Uh, we are all aware of the data and research related to um, how harmful cannabis use can be to developing brains and how it can convey increased risk of psychosis, suicide, anxiety, and aggression. Um, so again, I think it's just another area that we need to continue to focus on and to turn some attention to as we look to address this issue. Um, so I think those are my comments for the committee. Again, I just wanna thank you all for the thoughtfulness of the memo. Uh, we are looking forward to implementing it um, and to working side by side with Boz, particularly on the data pieces. Thank you. Um, I think what may make sense is for us to entertain some questions now and then hear from others and take questions again later. Is that agreeable? Uh, so I think, uh, was it Representative uh, Burroughs, Representative Goldman? I, I'm last, put me last. <laughs> I think it was well, Bart, it Mari, and then I'm- It doesn't really do much matter. I mean, people take turns. So Art, go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, uh, Commissioner Squirrel, I want to thank you very much for mentioning a cannabis is a real issue with our kids. I've, I've fought uh, against the legalization of that drug for a long time now, and it's very, very important people realize the, the real problem it could be in our kids. I just want to make that statement. I do have a couple questions. Um, you talked about the Brattleboro retreat, and I, and I want to be clear, and we've heard a lot about it, and, and I'm not familiar with the place, so my question might be very elementary. 
Is that a place where children can be placed? I, I know Representative Donahue, I brought it up before and it's for adults, but it, I, I wondered what you said regarding the Brattleboro retreat that might have a component with, with children. Yeah, thank you, Representative Peterson. Uh, the Brattleboro Retreat is our largest inpatient hospital in the state of Vermont. Um, it is also the only inpatient hospital we have in the state of Vermont for children and youth. Um, so they have a total of 30 beds. Uh, they have a child unit and an adolescent unit. Um, so I made that note um, simply that the, sustain, the sustainability and the stability of the retreat are critical to the system of care, which is why we have been working so hard to ensure that they are fiscally stable, um, because without the retreat, then we actually don't have any child and youth inpatient capacity in the state. If I can jump in, to just, just to say, just to be clear, we're talking about inpatient mental health treatment here, when you, the commissioner says the only inpatient mental, the only inpatient unit for children, the largest uh, hospital inpatient services. So just for Representative Peterson, that we're not talking general hospital here, we're talking- Oh no, I understand okay, that. Okay, I just yeah. want to be sure that we're not- Yeah, right, no, but I appreciate that. Um, so, so if a child goes into the emergency room in Rutland um, with a problem with a, and needs to be sent to a place, can they be sent to the Brattleboro Retreat, that hospital, uh, as an inpatient? Yes, if they are found to meet hospital level of care, then yes, um, they would be admitted to the Brattleboro Retreat. And how many beds are occupied there right now? Can you tell me that roughly? I mean, you, maybe you don't know. I can look it up in just a second. Um, they have, again, they have capacity for 30. Um, I know that they've, on the adolescent unit in particular, which is an 18 bed unit, um, they've been operating at a capacity of about 14 or 15, but I can pull that up in a minute and take a peek and see what it is today. Okay, I'm only asking because one of the things we've, I think I've heard is that the, the backlog here is that a, a child goes in the emergency department, gets seen, determined that he needs to be, he or she needs to be um, in an environment, uh, I forget the word, but in an environment where he has to, he or she has to stay in a, a place committed um, and that there's no place to send them. And I'm wondering if that facility at Bravo Retreat has bed space. I mean, why aren't we sending them there, I guess? Yes, so it's a great question. There are a couple pieces there. Um, so there are factors that influence the capacity of any inpatient unit at any given time. So the Brattleboro Retreat has 18 adolescent beds, let's say. On any given day, three to four of those beds may be closed. Um, that could be due to staffing issues. We certainly know that across our healthcare workforce, we are experiencing significant staffing issues. Also, running an 18-bed adolescent unit at full capacity, um, that's, that's an intensive unit. Um, so there are times where the Brattleboro Retreat, given the acuity of the unit and the youth that might be on it, might also need to make adjustments to capacity so that they can ensure that they can keep all of the youth safe. Um, so that's just a little bit just in terms of how capacity on that unit might fluctuate. And that really applies to any inpatient unit across the state, child, youth, or adult. Um, those are factors that are at play. I think what's really important for us to keep our eye on, um, which is this continuum of care. Um, so what's really critical is that for those children and youth who are ready to discharge from inpatient, that we have the appropriate community-based services to discharge them to, um, which would be residential programs, um, hospital diversion programs. And then on the other side, we really want to put our energy and emphasis into diversion um, because ideally we don't want children and youth to need to access this highly restrictive level of care, um, which is why our work with our community mental health agencies is so critical, uh, why are we are looking at initiatives such as mobile response, which will allow us to respond more proactively to children and youth and their families in their homes before they need to go to an emergency department 
and other alternatives to emergency departments, um, such as the PUC program, um, which is an alternative to an ED um, for children and youth. If I could Thank just you. add one thing. This is uh, David Ritu, the medical director for the child division of DMH. Uh, Representative Peterson used the word committed, and I just wanted to be clear that uh, the retreat, most of the people who get hospitalized at the retreat are there on a voluntary basis. Uh, so they're not, they're not being committed there, uh, but both um, youth who are there on an involuntary and voluntary basis share the same space. That, that was a wrong choice of words by me. Um, I struggled with, it was impatient that I was looking for. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll move on to questions. Uh, so I, I can't tell on my screen. So those committee members who think they're next in line, just go for it. <laughs> All right, I'll go for it. Um, I'm really grateful for all of your work and um, particularly to hear um, that you've been focusing on um, systemic issues while, while also solving, solving the problem that's, that's right in front of us um, caused by systemic issues and situational issues. Also really glad to hear of your um, integrative work um, and that, uh, I know that you all talk with one another on a regular basis anyway, but that you're really, um, you have a, um, to use your words, uh, commissioner, you've set the table, you've got the people there in a formal way to address this. Um, I have a, a couple questions. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna ask them both at the same time. Um, commissioner, can you, uh, I'm interested about the, alternative payment model for the retreat. Um, can, do you have a two or three word phrase that you can describe what that is? Um, or you know, if it's similar to other payment models that we've been working with in the healthcare reform in Vermont. So that's one, what's the alternative payment model? The second one um, is in, with regard to UVM Medical Center opening up beds in their pediatric unit, which I think is a, a great move. Um, and I'm concerned, I don't recall that UVM Medical Center has pediatric psychiatry nurses. So are psychiatry nurses floating to the pediatric floor where they typically, the nurses there care for kids with cancer, um, RSV, various surgical issues, cystic fibrosis, um, or are psychiatry nurses that care for adults being floated to uh, inpatient pediatrics to take care of those kids? Great, thank you. I will take the first question and then I'll let Dr. Bertu um, answer the second question. So the alternative payment model at the Brattleboro Retreat um, probably what is most similar is the alternative payment model um, that we have with our community mental health and designated agencies, uh, where we essentially um, uh, have determined, you know, what the breadth of scope and services that they're providing in the community at any given time, um, what are the utilization components around that, how many people are they serving, et cetera. And then we pay them prospectively um, for providing those services. So all of our designated agencies and specialized service agencies receive prospective payments. And then there's a reconciliation process by which we look at uh, utilization, volume, all of those things that are required for accountability of an alternative payment model. With the Brattleboro Retreat, we recognized um, that some of the challenges that were contributing to their fiscal instability was some of the fluctuation in demand. And then of course, COVID created um, a significant fluctuation in demand and to continue to operate in a completely uh, fee-for-service model uh, was not going to be sustainable to them. Um, so what we did was we developed an alternative payment model by which we looked at um, the breadth of their services and you know, bed availability essentially and said, you know, we will assume that um, this will be the utilization for all of these units across the Brattleboro Retreat. 
Um, here is that number and the cost and the rate. And then we bundled that into a monthly prospective payment that they receive. So that creates stability for them. It doesn't necessarily need more money, um, but it creates stability in terms of their cash flow, um, which is essential for them as they are trying to you know, regroup around workforce development and et cetera. Um, and then again, there's a reconciliation process very similar to what we do with our community mental health agencies. Um, I'm happy to provide more detailed follow-up information as well, but that's kind of a, a synopsis of the alternative payment model of the retreat. And as I noted, we were able to implement that in April. And just thank you for the great work of DIVA. That was a pretty significant lift um, to implement an alternative payment model in about three months. Um, and I will turn it to Dr. Ratu, who can probably best speak to uh, your questions related to the UVMMC pediatric unit. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I, I, it's a great question, and I think it speaks to why it's not as easy as it may sound to just bring <laughs> people up to a general pediatric floor because there are some really important things to be considering, um, you know, especially in the time of COVID, and the training of the nurses is one of them. Um, there, UVM does have a 24 7 psychiatry consult service and also now has a child psychiatry consultation service um, during the week. Um, and while the nurses on pediatric floors, as you may know, are, are pretty well experienced and trained with helping kids who are upset and dysregulated, um, they're not psychiatric nurses. And I actually, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know the answer about whether there's gonna be any switching over that maybe someone else uh, on the call does, and we can certainly uh, find out through UVM about that. Yeah, I mean, if I would be fine with a follow-up email. It's a concern I've mentioned mm -hmm. before and that a, a, a nurses spend, I, I very much appreciate the work of the um, physicians and nurse practitioners that um, provide the consultation services um, and the bedside nurses are with patients 24 hours a day. Um, so it's, de it's definitely an issue and I'd be happy to have uh, an email follow-up. Um, and just to, I'm glad to know that you're hearing my concern um, and if you could carry that forward. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm next. Well, you go. Okay, great. Uh, Commissioner Squirrel, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Um, my question is, uh, can you please tell us more about the um, community mental health system of care and what specific measures have been taken to bol bolster sustainability? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think what I can say, um, when the pandemic hit, we all had to sh shift and pivot fairly quickly. I think you saw DMH and AHS move very quickly um, to ensure that our community mental health agencies were stable, um, which is why we moved so quickly to get approval um, for a significant tranche of CRF funds to be deployed to the community mental health agencies. And all in all, I think the total amount of CRF funds that we provided to the DAs and SSAs over the past year was about $19.7 million. Uh, we also worked very quickly to ensure that their school-based mental health services, which is still a fee for service, part of their service delivery was also stable. And I noted some of the work um, that we had done there as well. I think we will have to continue to evaluate what the needs of our community mental health agencies are, where we need to target resources specifically. Um, as I noted, um, our great and incredible network of community mental health agencies across the state are readjusting to more in-person service delivery. We talked a little bit about that at our last testimony. Um, we have provided um, additional guidance um, in collaboration with VDH making it very clear what sector, if you will, um, the DA and SSA workforce is, thus allowing them to move into more in-person services. Um, I do think uh, that the workforce development piece, our ability to recruit and retain 
um, individuals in our community mental health agencies is absolutely critical, which is why we brought that forward as one of our recommendations. Our task force here um, at DMH, which is I think co-chaired by um, members of our community mental health agencies are working on a strategic plan related to workforce. Um, I believe there is also an opportunity as we look at different uh, federal funding or opportunities um, for the state. We absolutely need to prioritize our community mental health workforce. And in addition, as I noted before, um, we have been in receipt of just over $8 million in federal funds, um, enhancements to our mental health block grant, all of those funds go to our community mental health agencies. Um, so we are working closely with them to determine how do we target those funds um, to ensure that where there are gaps or needs or increased um, demand in specific areas uh, that we can be responsive to that. Um, in addition to, I think, work and planning related to the provision of school-based mental health services. I do think that as schools reopen, we will be able to better assess and identify where there are need areas. I also think there is going to be significant need identified and we need to be prepared for that. Thank you. And then, and just to say that that's, 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 that's such a broad and uh, involved um, area of trying to continue to sustain our community-based system that there's, there's so much more that can and will need to be understood as we all move forward. Uh, so I'm looking to Representative Page and Representative Black and have either of you, whichever, whoever wishes to go first. Representative Page, did you take your hand down or was that in, in, in anticipation of being called? No, I did take it down, but since I've been asked, I'll, I'll just, uh, just ask a couple of questions. Um, one, um, as we wind down here in the legislature, how can we ensure that the work and this letter that uh, uh, was sent to you, um, how can we ensure that, um, that things will improve during the summer until we get back regarding our children in emergency rooms. And then I thought I'd just, um, Commissioner Squirrel, give you the opportunity um, as you prepare to depart. Do you have any words of wisdom um, as you look into uh, the crystal ball? Um, advice to your agency or this committee on issues that um, may be coming up in the future um, that we, um, should prepare ourselves for. So I'll, uh, I'll uh, listen to your answer off, uh, off, uh, off the screen. Thank you. Yes, thanks Representative Page. What was your first question again? I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you'll it. have to repeat it again. Um, <laughs> as we wind down here in the legislature? Oh, thank you, yes. Um, yes, so the accountability is critical and that's why I noted um, there was also a lot of accountability related to um, the action plan for the sustainability of the Brattleboro Retreat. There were monthly reports that we were required to provide to the legislature. Um, I think we will follow a similar model as is outlined in your memo um, that we will create, um, we will translate all of these action areas, solutions, if you will, into an action plan. Um, we will then convert that into a monthly monitoring report um, that we can send to the committee on a monthly basis. Um, and of course, you know, should uh, specific legislators or legislative leaders be interested in meeting with the department, um, you know, during those summer months to kind of monitor our progress towards implementation of these action areas. Uh, we welcome that. Um, so I think you see us, you know, really taking that charge seriously. Um, and I think the reporting accountability on a monthly basis will provide you with the transparency that you need and the insight into where we're going as a system. Um, in can, terms I, can I just, excuse me, I just want to say, is there a point person that we can anticipate looking to, or can you identify at some point, if not today? Who the, who the point person, given your own transition, but who the point person would be at the department that we could turn to in the interim period when we're not in session around? Yeah, the, I think the, we would, I would say that that would be Shayla Livingston for now, our director of policy. And then we will determine um, 
who the appropriate point person will be for this work going forward. Okay, thank you. Yes. And to your second question, Representative Page, I guess maybe three things come to mind. Um, first and foremost, that I think one of our strengths as a system and in Vermont is our um, value of collaboration and partnership. We are incredibly fortunate in Vermont that we are a small state. Um, we can get our arms around issues in a way that no other state can. We can implement things and bring them to scale much more quickly and comprehensively. And I also think that continuing to maintain um, collaborative, trusting um, relationships between the legislature and the Agency of Human Services and the respective departments is also very important. Um, that there is shared dialogue, there is shared accountability, and also trust um, that uh, those individuals who work in state government at the Agency of Human Services are incredibly dedicated and work so hard every single day um, to continue to advance the system of care. Um, second to that, um, I would have to underscore our efforts as a state um, to lean in and prioritize um, early intervention and primary prevention as another strategy and area that we need to focus on. Um, we all know that children are setting their long-term health trajectories in their earliest years. And um, the more that we can move upstream, the better the outcomes. Um, the more that we can continue to enhance and scale up our collaboration um, with pediatricians um, in those first zero to six years, I think is absolutely essential. And I think Vermont has an opportunity uh, to really focus our energy and efforts there. And then on the other end of the continuum, um, we need to come back to um, the mental health needs of our older Vermonters. Um, geriatric psychiatry, it is still a significant gap in our system of care um, that we need to be able to address. Um, so I think those are some of the, the things that come front of mind to me right now. Thank you. Go turn to Representative Black and then uh, Representative Houghton and Representative Cordes. And then I'm going to suggest that we hear from our other uh, wit witness guests this morning and then open it up to questions again. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions, one for Commissioner Squirrel and one for Dr. Ritu, please. Um, so the first one is, and this is more of a long term, long range plan. Um, I'm, has there been any contemplation of diversifying um, inpatient locations? You know, you had talked about that um, Brattleboro often will have to close beds because the um, population of adolescents or children there might be more dysregulated at that time. So, you know, when you have that many children all together, it seems like we've put an awful lot of our inpatient eggs in Brattleboro's basket. And, you know, and I'm also thinking about obviously the needs of families. If, I mean, as I'm in Chittenden County, I have to be honest with you, after learning all the things that we have learned, if I was familiar with the system of care right now and my child was in a psychiatric crisis, I'm not sure I'd make that call. And that, that concerns me because I'm not sure which is worse, having my child sent to Brattleboro or not getting the help that my child needs. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's, a, if there's a long range plan of you know, making, possibly making smaller units more spread across the state um, rather than just concentrating on Brattleboro. Yeah, so Representative Black, all great points um, and a great question. And I think what we have articulated as part of our vision for Vermont is that over time, as we invest in, understand, implement um, more efforts around integration, that we would see our reliance on more restrictive higher levels of care decrease. That is our long-term vision. Um, at the same time, specifically, I think, for children and youth, stepping back and assessing what capacity we have and what we think we need as a state 
And is there value in diversifying some of that capacity? Also considering um, that one of the main solutions to this issue is not necessarily more beds, um, but more enhanced community-based services. So I think that is some of the tension that Vermont will have to grapple with over the next few years um, as there are additional assessments of child and youth inpatient capacity. I think many would agree with all of your points um, in terms of you know, having one large unit in a very southern area of the state um, becomes limiting. Um, if you are from the northern part of the state, that amount of travel for parents, I've heard from families how stressful that is to have to travel three hours to try to visit your loved one. Um, so I, I think that will be a question. Um, that I, both I don't think I'm suggesting more beds. I'm suggesting less beds in more places. Again, I think that's something that the state um, in collaboration with the legislature and the, with the Brattleboro retreat um, will need to consider. Um, and also, of course, um, taking into consideration that um, the retreat is one of our largest inpatient providers. So you also have to attend to the fact that we don't wanna destabilize them as well. Um, so that's the balance. Um, and I think this is why we have worked so hard to try to clear whatever barriers we can in terms of access to CVPH, which is in Plattsburgh, which is closer. There are still challenges there. It's not ideal. Um, so I think your question is a good one. And I think it's something that will need to continue to be evaluated. Thank you. And my question for uh, Dr. Ratu, only because we've discussed this before, and I think it's a really important point to make particularly with some other things in the legislature right now. I was wondering if you could talk specifically to issues around cannabis and what we're seeing at this time and any concerns around that. Sure. Um, yeah, and I'm so glad Commissioner Squirrel brought this up because, um, you know, while we don't have good systematic data yet, I think many healthcare professionals are becoming very, very concerned about this. Um, you know, I, I also work at UVM. I spent last weekend on call for UVM psychiatry. So I was actually in the emergency department talking to kids, talking to adults. And, you know, I've, I've observed um, over my times on call that a significant proportion of, of young people who are hospitalized psychiatrically or come to the EDs are heavy cannabis users. And we also know that the cannabis that is being used today, which can be 20, 30, 40% THC is nowhere near you know, what was used back in the 60s. And uh, the research that this is a significant psychiatric risk for a whole host of problems, most notably psychosis, but I think also suicide and aggression is becoming increasingly recognized at the same time that the public perception is going the exact opposite way. And so I'm really hoping that, um, you know, as uh, sort of the cannabis advisory board and the, that people will really be paying attention to this and that we'll have the data to monitor this because I think it, it could really impose a really large burden on our, our mental health and substance treat, abuse treatment system moving forward. Very concerned about this. Thank you, thanks for elaborating. So I'm gonna, again, let's uh, turn to Representative Houghton and then um, I, I'm gonna ask if Representative Cordes and Representative Donahue might be able to hold their questions so we can be sure to hear from others first and then we'll open up to more questions. Mine is very brief. It's not a question. Okay, well, Representative Houghton. And, and mine is actually, um, my comments are directed more towards Agency of Education and Heather. So Heather, if you have testimony, I will wait until that point. I, I'm assuming we'll perhaps get to hear from others who have okay. come from the Agency of Education as well. Uh, Representative Cordes. Commissioner, I don't know if I will get another chance to say this, but I uh, just wanted to tell you how much I've appreciated working with you in the last, um, over the last two terms. And um, I'm very grateful for your work. And I think that um, you've taken the, the department in a, a good direction. Um, and um, I think 
many of us will will miss you. I, I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. So let me turn back to the commissioner and because I, I know there's still some further questions and uh, but let's let's give have the opportunity to hear both from uh, the agency of education uh, who has Heather Boucher here with us today, and then from Voss. Is that is that appropriate? Yes, I think that makes sense. Okay, so let's let's turn first to the agency of education, and then we'll hear from Voss. Thank you, uh, Chair Lippert. Good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to also thank the committee for the opportunity to come in and uh, share a bit about what's going on um, in the education space that's relevant to this issue. And then also certainly um, make myself available for any questions committee members might have. Um, it's a little bit um, daunting to kind of try to figure out where to jump in. Um, so I think what I will do uh, perhaps is first state that we stand in strong um, support with the Department of Mental Health and our very eager to uh, partner with them as needed, um, as required or asked for in the uh, letter um, to assist as we can um, with this critical, critical challenge that is also very concerning to us in education as well. Um, I think uh, you've heard a bit about our partnership with mental, mental health, the Department of Mental Health and um, the designated agencies. And I thought I might expand a little bit on that. Uh, this, this work between our two agencies has been actually going on, I, this is my sixth year in the Agency of Education as the deputy, and we started this work um, two commissioners ago, I believe, for the mental health uh, department. So we have um, long been uh, really understanding and really wanting to address the systemic issues that uh, interface between education and um, mental health and well-being. Um, personally, this is a very interesting and um, really critical topic for me. A lot of folks don't know, but I actually am a psychologist. I'm actually a developmental psychologist. And so my entire career has been in the interstitial spaces of education and psychology. Um, and so it's a really critical, um, really critical arena of um, focus of support and interest. Um, and I am grateful that under the past two, um, the current and the prior uh, Secretary of Education that uh, value, they have also valued um, this integrative work. We have, um, as just some evidence of that work together, um, we have successfully launched a SAMHSA grant, a Project AWARE grant in um, several, uh, three of our districts and several of our schools within those districts um, where we are focused on not only providing more school-based clinicians in those schools, but are also providing uh, significant professional development and um, supports to um, the existing educators to uh, really bolster those local systems. Um, this is a pilot program. Uh, we certainly intend that, that the um, pearls of wisdom from, from this project uh, will actually uh, certainly be scaled up as we move forward. So um, I'm stating this because I think it's important to know that our partnership is not solely due to uh, the COVID pandemic, the emergency that we've actually been uh, working together uh, prior to um, this certainly health emergency. And it's only gotten um, more uh, critical and stronger um, as a result of um, the emergency. So uh, we're very happy to uh, continue our partnership um, with mental health. Um, I thought it might be useful. I'm not really sure um, how much folks on um, this committee have sort of followed what's happening in schools. Um, I'm just, this is a new committee for me to testify before, so I thought I might just give a very high level of sort of what's, what's been happening in terms of the orientation of schools um, because of the pandemic. So back in March, as you probably certainly remember, everything was shut down as a result of the governor's executive order. So that means sh schools were literally overnight shut down. Um, for about three weeks, um, we 
rapidly, um, we meaning both the agency, but certainly also folks at the local level um, worked really hard to come up with um, what education would look like in the immediate uh, future at that time. So we actually were focused on something called continuity of learning, which was, okay, kids are actually home, school is not happening. How do we ensure that they get the services um, to the extent that they can in this in this health emergency and have some semblance of continuity. So uh, we required that uh, districts actually uh, provide what were then called continuity of learning plans where they had to really think through these issues again in an emergency capacity. Um, we always knew that we were doing the best we could both at the state and the local level, but that there would be challenges. Um, and as we saw, there certainly were. So we saw um, and again, I'm talking from last year, March to the end of the school year, that um, there were certainly students whose needs were not being met, um, who, you know, because of the restrictions on in-person gatherings um, were, were, you know, not going to get the services that they really needed. So moving from that space into what the next school year would look like, which we focused uh, as sort of our reopening phase of the pandemic, um, lar you know, it was really uh, front and center focused on safe operations of schools and making sure that schools could sustain safe operations because again, um, the, the health aspects of um, the pandemic really were taking front, front and center, which I think we all think made a lot of sense, but we also knew that the social emotional learning and um, implications for mental health, psychosocial adjustment, student engagement were also going to be just as critical. So uh, we worked together on uh, some guidance that went out um, in the summer uh, for social emotional learning and how to, and we worked with uh, mental health on this um, and, and really focused on like what districts should be thinking about and putting in place so that they could actually attend to students' social emotional learning needs, their well-being, um, their mental health um, functioning. So then, yep. Can, can, can I, I apologize. I totally apologize for interrupting you, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, and I think now your screen froze as well. No, no, you're there. Okay. Uh, let, let me let me apologize to you and to the committee. I understand that Commissioner Squirrel and Dr. Ratu are, I'd forgotten, I'd been told that they are needing to leave uh, in just a, a minute or two. Uh, and if that's the case, still, I, I wanted to at least have a, a moment uh, to interact with Commissioner Squirrel before, before she leaves the screen this morning. And again, my apologies for interrupting you so abruptly and not usefully. Um, and because I, because I, th this may be, uh, I mean, uh, I, so I, I appreciate uh, that uh, Representative Cordes also expressed her, her appreciation uh, to Commissioner Squirrel, but uh, as, the, as the chair of this committee and on behalf of the committee, uh, I really want to express my deep appreciation to you, Commissioner Squirrel, for the work that you have done in the period of time that we have had the chance to work together and for your uh, deep commitment and the values that you bring and have brought to this work. Uh, and this may be a given, because we're coming to a close, it's not clear when we will have that opportunity to thank you directly again. Uh, I, I personally uh, want to express my deep appreciation for you and my uh, best wishes for you uh, and say we look forward to working with your successor, mm -hmm. uh, but, we want, we, but we would be very remiss not to uh, acknowledge uh, the work together that you have so, so ably led the department. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, Representative Lippert. Um, and I just wanna say and thank the committee, you know, we have done a lot of great work together. Um, and I deeply appreciate each and every one of you and your dedication um, to serve in state government um, and to really focus on ensuring that we have the strongest mental health system um, as possible. You know, I started my work back when I was about 22 years old, working in a um, adolescent residential um, program and have never looked back. Um, this is my passion. This is my work. Um, it is so personally meaningful to me. 
Um, and to be able to sit in this seat, in this position for the past two and a half years um, has absolutely been the greatest honor that I could have ever had. Um, so I just wanna thank you all. Um, it has been nothing but a pleasure to work with all of you. Um, and I am sure I will find my way back to this work um, once we make our family move um, and we'll be able to contribute hopefully in the way that I've been able to contribute in Vermont. So thank you all. So thank you, thank you, thank you again. Okay, and um, uh, as awkward it was to interrupt you, Heather Boucher, I, <laughs> nevertheless, it just felt that I, I had not anticipated the timing and was intending to speak uh, to the commissioner before she uh, left with us today. So um, let's turn our attention again to uh, continuing to understand the Agency of Education's involvement. And I understand that Shayla Livingston will stay with us uh, from the department as uh, the commissioner and Dr. Ritu are uh, needing to go to other commitments this morning. Should I, should I continue? I, I think you should. And I, I, you know, I, I'm, I, but I'm gonna be, I'm just gonna say it's, it's important for us to, I mean, high level is great. And I think we're actually interested in, you know, kind of on the ground, how things are, what's happening. So I think, I think that'd be useful to, if we could focus there as well. Sure. And then, then I do want to hear from Vaz because we have some very, we, in our letter, we had some very specific uh, requests, suggestions, and, and I know they've sent us some information and subsequently, so, so that's, that we need to keep room for both. And uh, let me, before we, before I rudely interrupt someone else, let me just check in terms of timing. Uh, Devin, are you, what is your, uh, are you, you're good for time? And okay, and Emma, okay. Well then, uh, yes, let's let's hear further from you, Heather, uh, and uh, then we'll entertain some questions or perhaps hear from Vaz and then we'll entertain questions. So, thank you. Great, and I think I forgot to say for the record, uh, Heather Boucher, Deputy Secretary for, ed for Education earlier. Right. I think I will, um, focus primarily uh, for the rest of my comments on the current phase that we're in. Um, so we, uh, and I believe um, this had been referenced earlier by Commissioner Squirrel, we uh, required uh, significant recovery planning efforts. So when we talk about education recovery, we're talking about um, what uh, LEAs, which are local education agencies, which basically is lingo for school districts and schools, uh, are doing in terms of mitigating the um, impact of COVID on students. And uh, we have um, identified three different uh, areas or buckets that we're requiring LEAs to actually do a, a needs assessment within, and they've actually completed those. They were due April 15th. So those are uh, social emotional learning, mental health and well-being. Uh, student engagement and truancy reduction, and then of course academics. And the reason why it's really critical to, to highlight this is because uh, we actually were very adamant about the fact that all three of these areas need to be equivalently attended to for um, a robust education recovery effort um, for our state. We actually were a little bit ahead of um, the national curve, if you will, on this, because we had done so well as a state in terms of um, in terms of what's happening with the virus. But other states have taken a cue from us and and certainly have um, also uh, focused on social emotional learning and mental health. So, um, what our preliminary a very preliminary scan of that needs assessment um, looks like is that yes, there, there is a, an increase in um, mental health needs, in mental health referrals, in uh, the needs for uh, student and family uh, supports. Um, we're also, um, one of the things I wanted to identify is that we're also working on um, implementing on an implementation plan as part of recovery for our districts, and that is in deep partnership with the Department of Mental Health and um, the Division of Children and Families. And so each of our districts has its own um, uh, individually tailored based on their needs assessment uh, state team that is comprised of the Agency of Education staff, 
and then supplemented with folks from mental health and um, children and families, depending on what their needs were um, identified um, as a result of the needs assessment. So um, Laurel Omland, who I believe still might be on or perhaps not, has been a real critical partner in that work. Um, she attends uh, weekly sessions that we have with our districts where uh, they bring um, problems of practice to bear. Um, so we are actually, as a state, um, the state agencies are, are have one eye toward working towards state infrastructural solutions around funding and some of those issues that Commissioner Squirrel talked about. But we're also uh, doing some more hands on the ground, really sort of like holding the hands of our districts as we move forward to really support them um, where they need it. So I just wanted to, to clarify um, to clarify a bit about what's happening from the state's perspective in, in that arena. Um, I'm very happy to take questions. I'm very happy to um, you know, clarify any information that uh, committee members might need. Great. I'm sure I've forgotten something to mention, so I hope it comes up in um, questions. Sure it will. So why don't why don't we turn to uh, Representative Houghton? I think you had earlier had a question that you said was more uh, involved in the area around the agency of education, and so Representative Houghton, why don't you? Thank, thank you, and Heather, thank you for being part of this important conversation. Um, I uh, serve Essex Junction, so the comments I'm about to make are relative to what I've heard from families within the EWSD school district. And just so you know, I have a seven year old, a seven, seventh grader, not seven year old, seventh grader um, in the school as well. Um, and the efforts the agency and the local school districts have made have just been outstanding um, to ensure continuity over the past year. So I appreciate that. Um, and I guess. You know, we're all excited to go back to school. I mean, the kids are excited, the parents and the teachers are excited to go back to school. But as we go back and focus on social emotional learning um, and assessing the needs of our kids, I'm hoping we don't forget um, what we've learned, the positives that we've learned through this. And a couple of things I've heard from families is one, that the class in, in EWSD for everyone, it has been, been hybrid this year, um, as well as a remote academy that some people have attended. So for the hybrid kids, I've heard directly from kids that they like the smaller class sizes. They have one-on-one -on -one connections with their teachers they did not have before. And a lot of the behavioral problems teachers have seen in classrooms has gone away. I've heard that from the kids and the teachers. And then I think the other important thing to remember is that it's hard to be hybrid. It's hard to be remote on families. I get that, but for some kids, they've been able to find the time to focus on or, or become interested in more things that are important to them. Whether it's something in nature, you know, doing a science project that maybe they wouldn't have had time to do in school and that getting outside um, has been really, really helpful for some of these kids. And I think that's important as part of social emotional learning and academic um, assessments as we move forward. And I, I guess my final, this isn't related for a question, but my final, final comment would be that as we go back into the box of the school, that I hope we continue to, to think outside of the box. And there's a structure that has to happen in the school but there's been lack of structure that has happened in hybrid learning that I think has been very beneficial for some kids that will help in their social emotional learning as they continue. So thank you. Sure, uh, thank you, Representative Houghton. Um, if I may respond, um, I think that the points you brought forth are, are great points and they're something that we're definitely in agreement with. So we have always been uh, trying to think about what are some of the ways that we have had to, because of the emergency, pretty rapidly change the way we're doing um, education that we actually wanna hold on to. And that's always been something that um, we have had an eye toward um, as we sort of worked through these different um, dispositions in terms of what our education system looked like. We meet, um, the Agency of Education, um, myself and the secretary meet pretty meet weekly with an advisory group um, from folks who represent um, principals, who represent superintendents, who represent teachers, who represent pretty much all different um, entities that are, are related to education systems. 
and there's strong agreement within that group as well. Um, so I don't want to give the, I would want to make sure that um, I state publicly that I do believe um, most of our districts have that frame as well. They're really interested in looking at what, what has really worked for us that we want to actually um, continue moving forward. Um, preliminary scan of these needs assessment data actually indicate that what you've noticed in Essex is certainly not only happening in Essex with respect to behavioral referrals. Again, the data are not fully um, analyzed yet, but um, it does appear that in many districts, um, the smaller class sizes, the um, not uh, mixing things up in the hallway um, with students, um, so keeping them in a pod structure, um, has really um, worked in a lot of ways. And so we will certainly be looking at what can we do as we move forward to um, perhaps think about uh, what we can move forward with in, in the box, as you called it. I do wanna point out though, an issue that is very important for us as well, which is equity in the agency of education. And so one of the things we have to keep in mind, um, per, 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 particularly when we think about a state perspective is not all students have equitable access to um, the uh, hybrid opportunities. And so we do, you know, we really focus on in-person learning because we know that that is, um, that is the, still the best way to actually have an education that's equitable and accessible for all students. So I do think that's something that will also be part of our contemplation as we move forward is how do we, how do we make sure that if we're going to have a continued hybrid footprint um, in terms of um, our education system, that it's actually equitable. And so it isn't just all the students who have privilege and are able to, to get um, access to those hybrid opportunities, that are experiencing that and all the students who can't are, are in the brick and mortar. I mean, that's a really critical issue that we've all got to come to, grip, to grips with, I think, as a state. Thank you, Heather. I would absolutely agree with that. Um, and I appreciate you bringing that up. It's, it's very important. And I'm not suggesting that hybrid, you know, should be extended, but just the learnings with from the hybrid system, I think are really important. And it sounds like the agency is on top of that in the school district. So thank you very much. Yep, you're welcome. Great, I'm gonna to turn to Representative Burroughs. And, uh, and then, uh, then I think I do want to hear from Voss because I'm just concerned that we not uh, fail to have time to hear from uh, them as well. Representative Burroughs. Thank you. Um, I, I, one broader educational question um, following back with what, what you just said. Um, do you think the Agency of Education will reconsider its um, recommended class sizes as a result of what you've what you've taken uh, from this experience? That's my first question. My second question um, is, uh, is the Agency of Education doing anything to um, accommodate uh, students who have been homeschooled this year who have faced really um, extreme isolation as they return to school next year? or if they return to school next year? Sure, I, I think I'll uh, take your second question first. So um, yes, so part of our focus on ensuring that all districts have a very strong plan for how to address all students, social emotional learning would capture that group of students who were um, uh, primarily home um, and who are coming back. And um, you know that's very likely to be a, a very, um, unique transition for students who are in that, um, that learning disposition. You know, we know from, you know, we're hearing about that just um, in the media about adults actually moving back into what in person, the in-person world looks like um, as a result. So yes, um, and that again will be part of this teaming process that we have with mental health and with um, Division of Child Children and Families to actually make sure that as districts identify particular needs that they're seeing. So for some districts, there was a very strong footprint of home study. And overall, we know that home study uh, families actually more than doubled as a re well corresponding with the pandemic. But there are some where that's actually not going to be a big issue because for a variety of reasons, um, they didn't see a big in increase. So I think that it's a great question. And I think it's built into the system that we've actually set up because they're going to be actually um, 
measuring and looking at what those look what what that adjustment looks like for their students and so then we'll be able to actually tailor supports for them um it's interesting because i don't know if there are i don't know if that's a question that has been sufficiently addressed um nationally Part, part of the thing is that the, you know, normally I think in Vermont has a very strong homeschool community and, but which fell apart during the, the, um, this past year. Um, and so it's, it's been a different experience, I think a lot for a lot of families and, and anecdotally, I can say the homes, I'm on the school board, but I can say that the homeschooling families I know of are really reaching a crisis level at the moment because, um, their, their kids are feeling extremely isolated. I just wondered how, how to pick up those pieces. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think it's a good question. I mean, I think the way I framed, the way I interpreted your question was, um, how do we actually help students who are transitioning back into the public school system? Um, most states, I would say, including ours, um, don't have a very strong regulatory context for home study. Um, it's, it's kind of, if parents have chosen to kind of opt out of the public system, there are some things we can do. Um, but I do think it's really critical that, um, it's a good question and I think it's really critical. We obviously care about all of our students in Vermont. And so I think that's an important um, piece that we'll you know, it's good to hear that as a question and we'll attend to that moving forward. Regarding the issue of class size, um, I do think that's something that we will um, continue to look at. Um, we certainly haven't made any decisions on what we would recommend to the State Board of Education on current um, education quality standards, but um, it is something that is certainly, um, you know, something that we're, we're going to spend some time reflecting on, particularly given uh, the data showing, um, you know, a reduction in behavioral referrals. So um, I do think that's um, a good point, and it's something that we had intended to be thinking about already, and will continue to. Um, there's a lot of factors, obviously, that go into how um, class size is calculated. A lot of those, a lot of the um, recommendations from um, both within our state and also nationally come from a non-pandemic situation. And so we're kind of, you know, we're kind of uh, working with a completely blank slate in some sense. So we'll be trying to actually figure out um, what makes sense in terms of we're moving obviously and wanna to move towards whatever sort of a stable system looks like after the pandemic, but also um, we anticipate there's certainly, you know, we anticipate recovery being a three to five year prospect. And so, you know, we don't, we don't have a disposition where we're immediately snapping back into, okay, everything is exactly the way it was. Um, we don't think that's actually going to be very helpful for students or families. Um, it needs to be a very thoughtful and gradual uh, recovery process. So I think that also fits in that particular perspective of one of the features we would look at is like, what does the classroom actually look like as a result of what we've learned um, in the pandemic? If I may, just as a quick, and then I'll probably be quiet because I know you have other folks you need to hear from. One of the, um, one of the interesting lessons we learned, and I think um, this is also something that um, has been um, discussed and, and sort of replicated um, in other states' experiences. When we first were uh, figuring out how do we do this kind of um, emergency overnight on the fly um, system and then also um, focus on our, our re-entry, I think many of us thought, um, okay, so a big part of that is going to be virtual learning, is going to be some kind of hybrid system. And I think many of us, and you know, I'm a little um, chagrined at myself because my area is adolescent development, um, but we had kind of thought, okay, this will be, we're, we're really focused on our younger students and getting them back to in-person because those, um, you know, those interactions are so critical. They really need to be, um, you know, back in school because they can't really learn effectively um, online. And so, what we realized though, is that who has actually struggled more in this pandemic are actually our older, our older kids, our middle school students and our high school students. 
And I say that not in a way that I think we did something wrong. I think we were using like the best thinking at the time. And like I said, we're not, we're not different than what other states had done. It's more one of those unanticipated like, oh, and the social needs were so critical for middle school and high school that, you know, in a perfect world, we might have thought about this differently. Again, though, we were also dealing with um, requirements, um, health requirements based on the virus. And so, you know, we knew at the time that um, adolescents in high school, for instance, were much more like, were much more biologically like adults and, and could not be in um, small, you know, could not be in um, social proximity to each other. So I guess why I'm saying that is that we're all, we've all learned some important lessons and we're very committed to um, moving forward with that, um, that lens in mind. And certainly what we've learned about um, existing challenges with the mental health system and, and what we're taking forward would relate to that system just as well. Thank you. Um, and I think there, I think there's, as you say, there's um, much for us to learn still from our experience. I, I would just mention in passing that I received today a, uh, um, uh, an email from uh, the persons work, working with uh, what's called the, what the uh, expert uh, uh, program, uh, which does uh, screening and uh, talking, and I'm going to forward, I'll forward this to the whole committee and not try to represent it here right now, but uh, really talking about some of the issues of identifying like one in five youth are struggling with mental health, uh, one in four with substance use and one in 10 with self-harm, uh, that, that, that the impact is, is very real uh, during this period of the pandemic. And uh, so we'll, we'll continue. We'll continue to want to learn about that and the implications for the education system, which is where, as well as families and communities, where children are spending much of their time. I think at this point, I would like to turn our attention. I would like to hear from Devin Green. Uh, so, Representative Donahue, I see your uh, frustrated look at me when I say that. <laughs> so let's let's. But let's. I'm frankly need to balance all this. So let's, let's hear from Representative Donahue and Representative Chena, and then I do want to hear from Voss. I, I understand. I had a question for the Department of Mental Health, okay, which well, I was asked to hold off, but then they left. Realize, and I didn't realize the commissioner was needing to leave. So I, I understand. So that, no, I understand, but that's why I'm asking to raise it now because it is a carryover question um, for, for context. Um, as Voss responds and maybe not to answer, up front, but to consider as part of that and then answer at the end. Um, and that is when, when the commissioner responded to the question about geographic access for, for inpatient children's care, and the commissioner said, yes, that was an issue. Uh, she was aware that the state uh, and the retreat needed to, to look to and address and the, and the state was conscious of that. Um, and um, I, I wanna point out again that uh, you know, if cardiac care was only available in Brattleboro, we would not be looking to the state to solve that problem. We would be looking to the hospital system and our healthcare system to solve that problem. And there's a history of mental health segregation um, that, that created the need to have state intervention. And we're still, we're still in that phase trying to work out of it. But I, I would hope that in looking at this issue, um, we would be making that transition to the hospital system's responsibilities for ensuring um, all care is accessible where people need it. Um, and that is, of course, the focus of the Integration Council. Um, but as you respond to these issues, uh, I, I hope that it's um, starting to come from that place of responsibility uh, and not, um, not a state responsibility to ensure um, adequate care. So thank you. Thank you. And Representative Chino, uh, would you like to be heard at this point? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll just Please. make a quick comment um, because I don't know who's coming and going that, because what we have someone here from the Agency of Education, which is unusual for our committee. Yes. Um, and I appreciate the, the update. And I guess I just, all I would want to say is that 
if we can, if school districts can use Medicaid money to pay for police, which we found out has been happening, I'm hoping we can be creative and find ways to do more in the schools, um, to do preventive work, and maybe even to do more to support kids in crisis. Because right now, when when kids are in crisis, that you know, schools call for support outside the school, and a lot of times that escalates to kids ending up in emergency rooms. And there just might be more we can do for kids in the schools. So it was good to hear an update from you. Um, but I just sort of, I'm. I was concerned to hear that school districts are using Medicaid money for police and hopefully, and that does kind of intersect with the work of this committee. So while we had some from education here, I wanted to just throw that out there. So thank you. Uh, and that was something that's recently come to my attention and as I understand it is not in fact an authorized use of Medicaid funds and something that needs to be addressed. Okay. I would just, um, to, to add to that, I would just say we are looking into, into that and looking into what the actual use was. So we're, we'll be, we're happy to report back on what we find when we actually dig deeper into that. Great. I think we'd all appreciate hearing about that. So with that, I'd like to turn to uh, Devin Green and Emma Harrigan from Voss and give them an opportunity to respond both to our letter and to some of the comments that have been made uh, subsequent to in the course of the morning. So, Devin. Great, thank you. For the record, Devin Green from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. And I have here with me today, Emma Harrigan. And you can go ahead and introduce yourself, Emma. Good morning, Emma Harrigan with the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Uh, thank you for your time and attention to the issue of children waiting for mental health treatment in emergency departments. We realized that this came up late in the session and we really, really appreciate um, the work that you've done in this area and the letter that you sent to Vaz and AHS and the Department of Education uh, or the Agency of Education. We think that letter provides a good framework for AHS and Boz going into the summer and keeps the momentum going through the change in leadership at DMH. Um, and just as you thanked Commissioner Squirrel today, we would also like to thank Commissioner Squirrel and DMH. They have been great partners, uh, especially throughout the COVID pandemic. I know that they face a lot of challenges that we face um, they align closely with us and um, it must, it's difficult to come out of one emergency that we're actually still in and pivot to another one. And we really appreciate the, um, you know, the short term and medium term goals that they've set up in such a quick amount of time. So much appreciate their work in that area. Um, going to the memo, we, did have a couple of items we wanted to flag. One was um, the data on DCF custody status. We think I've sent this request to our ED directors about whether they can collect this data. They are very enthusiastic about providing data, so I think it will be fine. Um, uh, we did have one person who had some concerns, but we think that that will be possible and we will work with our ED directors uh, to make sure that happens. The other piece in the memo asks that the data be broken out by hospital. Uh, we are fine with breaking it out by hospital and submitting it to DMH. Uh, we think that that will give DMH an opportunity to see the system as a whole and address issues. We worry a little bit about providing this data to um, the public because if you have one person waiting in an emergency department for a certain length of days, can really get into issues of HIPAA uh, and privacy issues. And so we would ask that this information go to DMH, they can act upon it um, and they will have it. And then in terms of submitting it widely, uh, we'd ask that we provide statewide aggregated data for that. Um, and then one of the things that this committee was looking to understand a little bit further is how emergency departments work on the ground and what all of this looks like. Um, and we think going into this and in partnership with the state, uh, we would love to be able to actually bring you to the emergency departments 
um, so that you can get a sense of, you know, the differences between our critical access hospital emergency departments um, and our designated hospital emergency departments and um, our academic medical center and just create a baseline understanding of how these work and what is possible in all these areas and what they might look like. So I know we've been working super hard and haven't had much of downtime or vacation, but I would ask that you consider that uh, perhaps over the fall as we go into the session so that you have an opportunity to um, learn some more about those areas in our hospitals. And in terms of um, what Representative Donahue was saying about our hospitals taking this on, we are with you, we are looking at this. We, um, you know, we are coming here in partnership. We are not saying that this is the state's problem. We realize it's a hospital problem also. And so um, we are looking at all of this, uh, but just as I mentioned at the um, beginning of this session, it's really hard to, to, to balance quality and access and, um, and affordability in a rural hospital system. So we will be looking at all of this with that lens um, and certainly uh, hope to expand access going forward. And, and I think Commissioner Squirrel's point on prevention um, being a focus and trying to ensure that people do not end up here in the first place, just as we don't want to end, we want to change people's diets so that they don't have heart attacks and don't end up in a cath lab. Um, we also want to look at those uh, interventions and, uh, and emergency de department diversions as well. Emma, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, thank you. Okay, well, let, let me say that I think, so I think that you, you've done, you've, you've taken a, a, an important step previously around identifying data uh, that we find very helpful. And I think that uh, with some of the data requests that we've made in this letter, it, I guess what I'm hearing is, and I'm saying this, Shayla Livingston, you're here with us from Department of Mental Health and, and Devin and Emma from Voss that it sounds like the specific request for data and ongoing reports uh, seems agreeable to and achievable. Is that what I'm hearing uh, from the Department of Mental Health as well as the, as the as Vaz? Uh, I'm, that, that's, that's terrific. Uh, I, we will not be in session, but we, we as a committee are committed to trying to follow this. And so I'm, we will arrange for, for that. Uh, working with uh, DMH and Vaz to make sure that information continues to flow to our committee members uh, as we uh, continue to individually monitor this or as a, and as a committee. Um, we think that's critical because we don't want to lose the momentum, frankly. We don't want to lose the uh, sense of uh, what, what happens because we're here part of the year and you're here year round and we appreciate your ongoing uh, work and commitment but uh, we feel it's important for us to stay connected to this uh, as the department and VAS continue to address this uh, critical issue. I'm, I'm a little perplexed, but I, I don't, I maybe we can talk more offline, but I'm a little perplexed as to the HIPAA issue because I don't think anyone's identifying any particular child in, a, in an I emergency room. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just a little perplexed as to why length of time waiting there in any particular hospital would be identified any more than, than it would in any other situation. Um, but perhaps that's something I can understand more fully. Is that, Emma, do you want to comment on that? Yes. Um, so we're dealing with, I mean, we're in Vermont, the numbers are very small and we do lead, we do borrow examples from other parts of state government that use was called suppression on low numbers. So for example, if you're grabbing data from the all payer claims database and your numbers are less than five, um, you're just supposed to indicate that it's less than five. And so, right. for example, when we're working with smaller emergency departments who may only report one or two children waiting, knowing the location in which a child is waiting and how long they're waiting can be identifiable to people um, outside of this committee, people in the public who are reading the report. So we really wanna be sensitive about when 
we call out the location of one specific individual or two specific individuals who are waiting a particular amount of time. So we're committed to providing that level of detail, um, detail to DMH so they can um, be part of the process for identifying services for the individual. But at a public level, there is a risk of, of accidentally identifying an individual um, who's seeking services. Okay, well, we don't want to do that for sure. For sure. So we want to be sensitive to that. We just maybe we can all understand it as, as this moves forward and you provide that information to DMH. Uh, perhaps there's a way for uh, some, I'll just even suggest that some particular committee members might be able to sit down with DMH to review some of that and not make it a public uh, a document that goes well beyond what any one of us would want to anticipate uh, any consequences that, because that's certainly not, uh, I mean, we, we all want to be very sensitive to that. Um, so I, I want to raise one other issue, if I may, and, and this is again, Shayla, I, I know that you're here from the department, and I know we don't have anyone from Dale with us this morning, but it, but it, and it comes partly, it's touched on in terms of our request that for uh, children who are in the custody of the, of the commissioner of Dale, uh, I mean DCF. I'm not Dale. I'm, pardon me. I'm, I'm misspeaking. Uh, DCF, where uh, one of the questions that came. I mean, I think one of the suggestions was that there were numbers of of children in the emergency room settings who, in fact, were already who were in the custody of the state through DCF, and and that we don't have any. We don't get any picture of that. Uh, based on the data, at least as I understand it, the data that we're collecting. But I think that is important data to understand. Uh, and so am I, under, am I to understand that that is something that we can uh, try to uh, provide to DMH at least, and if not to the committee? Is that, I'm going to turn to Emma and Devin. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we will try to provide it. Um, you know, a lot of our hospitals are collecting that data by hand right now, and so they can, um, we can add that data piece in for them. There are a couple that are trying to automate this, realizing that this might be a process going forward, and, but they're all very motivated to do it, so we will do our, be our best to get that data to you. And then, thank you, that's great. Uh, and I'm just going to flag something, which uh, uh, again, we, we always have to look at what are the un, you know the unexpected consequences of an initiative in one part of state government versus another. And of course, I think many of us are pleased to hear that uh, again, we don't have DCF with us, so I'll, I'll, I'll mention it here because there's it, there is collaboration. Uh, but uh, we, I, I at least received, and I think all of us have received a memo from the commissioner of DCF talking about the intention of the administration to work hard to bring more children back into the state rather than having out-of-state placements. And I think the numbers are, there's a significant number of children who are in out-of-state placements. And one has to conclude, or one has to assume that if they're in out-of-state placements because there was not sufficient uh, uh, setting for them to be, uh, for their needs to be addressed in the state. So bringing them home, and I think uh, I don't have the, I'm, I'm missing the, it's, it's a type of in more intensive support uh, setting uh, in, in, in a foster care type uh, um, setting where they're going to be working to recruit additional uh, family settings and add, add additional support, et cetera. Sounds like a terrific initiative. One has challenges, but terrific initiative uh, that should do good things for children and families. I find myself thinking at the same time, will that potentially lead to additional pressures on our emergency psychiatric needs? Uh, I don't know that, uh, but I'm just, I just flagged that. And I would ask Shayla to particularly be thinking about the work between the DMH uh, and DCF to anticipate whether we will inadvertently be adding pressure uh, within our children's mental health system in the state where for, for some perhaps high needs children who are now placed out of state. I'm not saying it's wrong to bring them home. I think that's a good thing, uh, but we need to anticipate some of the potential or at least, in, at least be thinking about what, what that uh, collateral impact might be, not just for DCF, but for our entire system of care here in Vermont, which, uh, which reaches into emergency settings and into, into the mental health community settings as well. 
So that's, you know, something for another time to, and perhaps there's, and I'm very open to hearing about what is being planned and uh, maybe miss uh, apprehending what any concern that there might be there. But I wanted to flag that given our chance to mention it today. We can include maybe an update on that in one of our summer reports back to you I at some at some juncture. I, I would I would appreciate that. Okay, now I know that. Uh, re so, I, Representative Cordes, you had texted me that you had an update on some information you received. Uh, but before we go there, I wanted to check in with Representative Donahue if there was a particular question for Vaz a follow up. If so, I think uh, we'll go to Representative Donahue and then. Ribs and Cordes will still come back and hear from you. Um, uh, thank you. Yes, this is just a direct follow up to what the chair was just saying, because um, uh, it, I think it was a, a uh, news media uh, version of that uh, update regarding foster care. And um, I think that part of what it said was that um, that that they were hoping that this initiative would also uh, be addressing children who currently show up in the emergency room who are in foster care and that it might help um, reduce that. And quite frankly, when um, our, our sub work group was developing uh, ideas for what we should include in the letter, that was the specific reason that we um, added uh, tracking foster care because we, we, our response to seeing that was, we didn't even realize that a significant, some significant portion of those children are in fact uh, in foster care. So, um, so there's two ends of that, and and I think that's important to track. the The question I had, and and it may, uh, I don't know, it may connect with um, Representative Cordes' update, but um, just I appreciated the update on UVMMC. Um, we simply provided some examples brainstorming of current environment of care. And I'm just wondering if you have any response about what kind of other things, um, whether they be suggestions that we had made or things from the hospital end, um, are there any specific updates that you can provide on uh, things responding to what we've heard from parents about uh, you know, the current environment for children who are waiting? Yeah, I think, um, I think our plan going forward is to take all of your suggestions into consideration. I know that there's been immediate responses to the specific uh, areas that were raised by parents, which I think is helpful, but we are, as a hospital system, we are going to really look internally to see what is possible to um, change those spaces and make them um, more therapeutic for children. That being said, there is a potential limit on what we can do there. And we're also going to figure out what those limits are and why they're happening and, and if or how we can change them, which again is why I think it's important for this committee to come visit some of our emergency departments uh, to get a better sense of that as well. Uh Thank you. I, that may have been part of my concern in asking the question because you were referencing fall and I think we were hoping that some of the ideas were like you could institute next week. <laughs> Not yeah, I know. So I was saying you. visit. I wanted to give you a little bit of a summer break um, before <laughs> before demanding field trips, but you're welcome <laughs> to come out whenever. Thank you, and I think I think uh, related to that, I think I think this is Representative Cordes uh, indicated she had some further information that had been communicated to her actually in the course of our hearing. So, Representative Cordes, thank you. Yes, I um, heard from one of my colleagues who works on the uh, pediatric unit at University of Vermont Medical Center, which um, I'll just um, also add is. Um, um, a fairly therapeutic milieu. They've done a really wonderful job um, in creating a, a healing environment for, <clears throat> for kids. Um, what I heard from my colleague is um, that they are, um, the hospital um, is actively including uh, nurses on a, a committee um, 
planning how to um, address this and make sure that um, the staff um, are skilled and prepared um, to take care of um, uh, patients in these two beds. Um, and um, also to make sure that um, they have very clear criteria about um, what kids, um, kids with what um, mental health issues are being placed on that unit. So my, my concerns are allayed, um, everybody's working together and that's great. Um, and I would just add that I think knowing what I know about therapeutic milieu and the um, pediatric environment and um, what UVM Medical Center has done in the past, um, and also knowing that um, having heard from parents who have had to travel to Brattleboro um, and uh, with their kids or don't feel that the um, they're not happy with the um, situation across the lake, that if we could create capacity, inpatient capacity um, in the Northern part of the state, that, that would be really fantastic. Thank you, appreciate your sharing that update in particular. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking we're, we're getting to the point where we're gonna bring this to a close, but I wanted to also just say that uh, I think Vaz, you had, we had had a communication from Vaz about an upcoming training around children in emergency departments that you might want to also just uh, bring to everyone's attention. Uh, I don't think I have the specifics in front of me and if, if you do, that's great. If not, you could, again, make sure everyone knows about it because it seems like it's another piece of the larger initiative that we're all working together on. Sure, so I can give an update and I'm, I hope we're talking about the same thing. I think we are. So <laughs> <hope> we are. <laughs> <laughs> we've worked, partnered with uh, the Vermont Program for Quality and Health Care yes. yes. to bring um, Dr. Scott Zeller, um, who is an emergency psychiatrist um, who uh, was part of the group that created what's called the Alameda model in California and has moved into a more national framework called an empath unit. Um, and essentially what it is, is it's psychiatric urgent care or um, the intersection between emergency room services and psychiatric services or inpatient services. So it provides, um, provides a more supportive environment um, for people um, who are experiencing a mental health crisis and has shown some really promising um, results in terms of 75% of people who come into these units are able to be diverted back into the community. So it reduces pressure on inpatient care and provides more opportunity for people to be served in the community. Um, I think uh, some aspects of this were kind of being considered in part of CVMC's planning um, before the pandemic with their, with their design um, on the campus and increasing inpatient capacity and redesigning the emergency room. So we're just bringing the expert here to Vermont and it's open to, um, it's open to pretty much everybody. Um, it's an open medium. So that's why we sent it to you and we can certainly send the flyer again to reflect in the record. Um, but we're really hoping to have a very good conversation and possibly bring Dr. Zeller back to have more discussions about what could be done in emergency rooms to support um, patients who are experiencing a mental health crisis. So that will be open to members of this committee and other legislators who have, might have a particular interest in this. And again, I'm not trying to, I mean, I appreciate, I appreciate the initiative of trying to look at new and, or different models and, and not, not trying to sell this. I just wanted to, yeah, sorry. To just say that, that I just wanted to make sure we had the attention of our committee members about this. Is that the California model that you're referencing? I believe so. Okay. But it's evolved. I know there have been concerns about the California model when this was discussed several years ago, but I think the movement and um, the lessons that have been learned from the initial pilot or the initial design in California has really translated into some really good work in other parts of the, of the country. So, and definitely whatever is discussed by Dr. Zeller, I think there's always I think everything always needs to be right sized and and approached in a different way to work for Vermont. So we're just we're starting the conversation with the national expert, and we hope to continue it from there. Great. Okay, Representative Peterson. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, and Emma, thank you for uh, your testimony here. Um, my question though about that was the personnel who, who the, the first face people see when they come into an emergency department, will that person be trained or is that person trained now to deal with uh, these types of, of mental health issues uh, that, that occur in, a, in an emergency department? Are they, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, they must see a variety of things. They see everything from, you know, horrible, you know, health, uh, medical problems to, to now uh, more and more uh, mental health problems. I wonder how those personnel are trained to, to maybe diffuse a situation, calm down a, a patient, be a, a smiling, friendly face so that somebody feels like, they're welcome or, or, or in the emergency department. I mean, how are those people trained and are they trained or will they be trained more? Um, and not, not so much the, 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 the doctors or psychiatrists and psychologists, but the, the clerical help that uh, man the desk there. Yeah, so I'll jump in and say the emergency department folks are trained for anything right like they need to be there and ready for anything that shows up um and they are a place of triage and stabilizing and then transferring or discharging and so um because they need to be trained for anything they i think a lot of them do receive uh training in this area that being said i I think there's more work to be done there. Um, and it can't go as in depth necessarily. Like you don't wanna have your baby in an emergency department. There's, there's, um, uh, there is training that can be done, um, but I don't think people are going to be experts in this area necessarily just because they do have to be ready for anything um, to come in that door. Um, and it really isn't a place for treatment. It is a place to get the person to where they need to be going forward, whether it's just to stabilize and send them home or send them to uh, an inpatient unit. So, um, but again, we're looking into it. We think that there's more training that can be, can be done in this area. And so we'll continue working on that. Thank you. One other thing we've been looking into is uh, getting more uh, peer support into the emergency department. We've had this conversation with our ED directors and just in terms of the, you know, the smiling faces and the people who do have the training, um, you know, regulations do not allow uh, uh, peer support to take on any hospital services, but they can certainly be there to enhance the experience. And we think the fact that there's movement in certifying um, uh, peer support for mental health will really help give a framework um, that will be easier for emergency departments to work under and to sort of bring uh, this support system into their uh, EDs. Thank you. Uh, Representative Goldman. I want to thank you for, uh, Devin, for bringing up that idea of peer support because you also talked about having a baby and it reminded me about the doula model, which is a really important model for supporting women in labor. So yeah, the model exists. So yeah, let's just spread it. So that's great. Um, I'm going to take you up on your invitation to visit emergency rooms, but maybe in July we'll take you <laughs> yeah. to visit children, et cetera. But yeah, I think that that would be really an interesting field trip. So thank you for the offer. I'm tempted. I'm just going to say it. Uh, I have had occasion to be in emergency rooms over the past few years, and uh, each time I say, I'm actually doing research as the chair of the healthcare committee. <laughs> And in fact, at times it has been very revealing <laughs> to be an anonymous patient in an emergency room observing what's taking place uh, and not a special guest. 
So, but I, but I, but also, I hope, I hope we will take you up on that opportunity because I think there are times as well that I thought it would be very useful to be able to be there and ask questions or to hear from people as well. And so that, that's an invitation I hope some of us will be able to uh, take advantage of. Okay, I, I think with that, I'm going to bring this part of our morning, which is now gone uh, a good period of time, but I'm going to bring this to a close. Uh, thank you, Devin. Uh, thank you, Emma and uh, Shayla. And Shayla, there you are. I'm just trying to, I have to search the screen to see where everyone is. Um, and thank you, Shayla. And we will, and as, as uh, Commissioner Squirrel indicated, uh, as uh, this issue will continue and be important in her in the transition and leadership in the department that I was looking for a point person, she indicated that you would be the person, at least uh, that we would be directly in contact with as a committee in order, and there may be another point person identified uh, around this specifics, but uh, we will look forward to staying in touch with you, Shayla, uh, in, the, in, of the course. Course, in the course of this through the, as we come to adjournment uh, and move into our other lives, but uh, also we do, it's, this, is an, this is such an important issue. I think our goal has, I think, been well achieved. And I wanna thank, again, I wanna thank the, uh, subcommittee of our committee, uh, Representative Donahue, Representative Goldman, Representative China for help, helping to craft uh, the letter, which I think as we've followed up on that today, uh, I think has, has, in my view, has, has met many of our goals in terms of setting some timelines, uh, some uh, goals in motion for, for this issue to be continued, to get continued attention, uh, even as we move into uh, out, out of session ourselves but to keep us informed. So again, thank you. Thank you, each of you and, uh, and also the Department of Education or Ed Agency of Education, Heather Boucher, thank you for being with us as well. So there's one other thing uh, that we're going to switch to that is a different, different issue. Y'all you're, you're welcome to stay with us if you like, but I don't think you need to. Uh, and that is that uh, we had a number of uh, student interns with uh, different members of the committee in the course of this. And while I haven't done this in any organized way, uh, there had been a specific request. And I think we have one of the interns with us this morning. I'm going to turn to Representative Cordes, who's had the opportunity to have uh, Olivia Cook Churchill interning with her and uh, had requested the opportunity to say a few words to introduce her again, which we had done earlier, I believe, uh, but also give just a few words of uh, feedback about what it's been like uh, and thoughts they have as having been an intern with us. And then we're gonna close for the morning. So um, let's turn to Representative Cordes. Thank you, Chair Lippert. I um, was initially a little concerned that about my capacity to um, keep a, an intern um, from UVM busy enough uh, during our legislative session. Um, and because of um, who Olivia Cook Churchill is, that was not a problem. Um, I had a wonderful experience working with her. Um, she's very interested in, um, in healthcare, in health equity, um, and in climate and health, um, that, that intersection. Um, she also reached out to one of our um, committee members, Representative Chena, um, about H210. Um, but I, I just wanted to, to thank her publicly um, for all of her great ideas, her, her very good work, um, and for her commitment to these really important issues, and um, wanted to uh, give her a moment to um, say hi and um, share a few comments about um, her experience now that we're at the end of the semester and she's wrapping up her her finals. Great. So hi welcome, Olivia. Welcome, hi. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Zoom Zoom room of the House Healthcare Committee. I know you've been following us on YouTube. Uh, yes, thank you so much for having me. It's interesting to actually be on the Zoom call now. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all for all the work that you do for our communities and just generally improving the health of Vermonters. It has been such a treat to end my time at UVM um, interning for Representative Cordes and watching you all engage in the community discussions. 
Um, I've learned so much about just general processes in legislature and as a public health student um, interested in health disparities. It's been awesome to see you all acknowledge the inequities and um, take action in Vermont to make health more equitable. Um, that's why I was really excited to see H210 introduced this session and kind of follow along with that. And then also most recently in this internship, I had the awesome chance to speak with Dan Quinlan. Um, he is the director of the Vermont uh, Climate Health Alliance and he really opened my eyes to how drastic climate change affects our health, um, which is something I didn't really think about previously. Um, he talked a lot about policy efforts that are um, being made to promote environmental justice. Um, and also more specifically, he talked about um, how there is a need to look at recent rises in heat waves in Vermont um, that are affecting the health of our population. Um, so I know you're all busy, but thank you so much for letting me come on and say goodbye. And um, thank you all for the work that you do. Well, thank, thank you, Olivia. And um, I think I shared with the committee, we were talking about the Lincoln Gap recently, and I shared that I drove you. I um, took a risk and started to drive up the Lincoln Gap with you, not knowing whether it was open or not. And um, that uh, that field trip was uh, an, initiated by Olivia with her idea to get my campaign team together and other friends from the Lincoln area um, to just get out there on Green Up Day um, and join the community. So I loved having that opportunity to meet you in person, Olivia, and and work in the in the community and take a risky trip up the partway up the Lincoln Gap. And thank you for everything. Of course, it was so beautiful to drive up there and so nice to actually meet you in person finally too. Yeah, good. Well, thank you. Congratulations and uh, best wishes in your next adventures in your studies and life. Thank you. And it's a good reminder to just, <laughs> this is embarrassing, but it's a, it's a good reminder that there are numbers of us who have not yet met in person. We've been doing incredible amounts of work together. <laughs> And as a, as a committee, and, and we're, we're, I, I would like, I'm just going to say this, I would like for us to carve out some time, uh, and it doesn't, we'll need as a committee just to uh, uh, just reflect on our, our work together this, uh, this half of the biennium, uh, both uh, informal and maybe a little formal reflection. But uh, we'll, we'll try to carve that out it, as we enter into this new session, new part of the ending of the session, which uh, and I'm just going to say that there are there are still some issues in front of us and some opportunities maybe to put some more in information in front of us uh, where, where there, as the speaker has said on a number of occasions, we're in a period where there's this kind of hurry up and wait uh, type of activity, but there may be some discrete pieces of healthcare uh, information that we can bring before the committee in the course of this uh, as our time, our, our committee times are going to change next week as well. Uh, because it's the final week of the session and that is that we will be on the floor far, far more, uh, if that can be imagined at times, uh, that uh, to bring the session to a close. So I'm, I'm thinking some about that. And uh, so anyway, uh, Representative Donahue, you had a, I see your hand. You... Yes, thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, also thank on the on record, although uh, she's not here today, um, I also had a UVM intern, uh, Rachel Best, and she also was able to sort of plunge into an area. And uh, as the committee knows, we spent a fair amount of time looking at um, how to identify response to the needs in our forensic uh, healthcare response system. Um, and she, she did a great deal of research and turned up um, various other models that other states are using which um, will be of value to the work group itself. You'll probably hear me uh, reference on the floor when, we, um, uh, when I present our section of that bill. Um, but if anybody's interested in a copy of it, it's a, it's a list of uh, links and resources regarding some other examples of what other states are doing. So um, I thank her for her work uh, as well. Great, and uh, I think there may be other committee members who had interns. We didn't. This is we didn't organize this uh, as a planned thing. But if there are other acknowledgments that people wish to make right now, that that would be fine. Uh, and if not, we can do that another time. Great. 
Okay, uh, Representative Goldman. Well, I'll just take this opportunity to acknowledge my intern, Alexis Drown. Um, she got me through the session technologically. <laughs> and I'm really grateful. Um, I've been doing Zoom meetings monthly with my constituents. I couldn't have done it without her. Uh, she really is the total infrastructure of that. Um, and I asked her also to write a position paper on the Middlesex uh, facility. And she did a fabulous job on that and really helping me understand where I wanted to land on that. So I am grateful for her work. Um, and I hope we have an ongoing relationship. I hope that can, she's just a freshman, so we might be able to continue on. So I'm happy about that. So thank you, Alexis. Great. Thank you, Representative Goldman. Don't want to skip over anybody, but there's nothing that has to be done here. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that we bring this to a close for the morning, uh, then, uh, and stay in touch as we need to be flexible in responding to the appropriations committee's work. Uh, and oh, oh, I know there's two other two other issues. That, and again, I haven't said anything ahead of time, but I'll just mention that uh, S three is still an issue that uh, is. Uh, being looked at by the Judiciary Committee, and we did. Uh, we had a, you know, we took some significant time and had input into that. So that, uh, I don't know if Representative Donahue has anything that you wish that you are able to share, or wish to share. And then uh, I also mentioned that uh, it also just suddenly comes to mind. Uh, again, impromptu. If you wish to, if there's something to add, if not, that's fine. Uh, Representative Burroughs and Representative Cordes are being representing our committee on the emergency housing subgroup. And uh, if there's, uh, and maybe it's just a matter of letting us know that it's continuing or when it's, of its work, but if there's anything you wish to add, that would be, uh, we could do that quickly as well. But first, Representative Donahue. Yes, my apologies for not having initiated um, uh, the need to just to provide an update so the committee's aware. Um, the. S3 had been referred to appropriations and they did vote it out uh, yesterday uh, unanimously with the both the 25,000 uh, for the expert um, analysis support uh, and also with the additional resources for the per diems for uh, committee members who were not in work positions. There's also a significant amount of money that had nothing to do with our part of the bill, um, but in order to implement the changes in um, legal supports in the system. Um, there was a need for a, an appropriation there as well, but it didn't really involve our part. So um, it is on notice today. So it will be uh, on the floor uh, Friday and Tuesday. And uh, just as a reminder to committee members, because of the extensive work that we did on sections, I think it's five, six, and seven, uh, Representative Donahue uh, will be collaborating the Judiciary Com Committee has requested that uh, those sections be reported by our committee and Representative Donahue will be reporting those sections on the floor. Yes, well. it, there's there's a technical um, technical change in terms of, uh, of procedural things from, from past years. Um, we saw it with, uh, I forget which bill previously, but because I'm not a member of the committee, um, I cannot report on those sections at the time the bill is being reported. Uh, so Representative Lalonde, who's presenting the bill, will very um, briefly reference them and report that I will be reporting later. It will then go to the Appropriations Committee amendment, which has to be voted on. Uh, and then when it's time for, um, you know, uh, member questions, statements, and so forth, um, I, I will be recognized first just as a member of the, <laughs> of the assembly, but we'll get up at that point to uh, lay out and explain the sections that we worked on. Great. And on behalf so don't be surprised when I don't get up. <laughs> but doing that on behalf of the committee. Yes, on behalf of the committee, but don't be surprised when I don't get up right. at the time the bill is being reported. It's a procedural piece. So um, yeah. I'll re be reporting on our, our vote and so forth on, on that. Okay. And uh, I realize I did not give you any advance notice. Uh, Representative Burroughs, Representative Cordes, if there's anything uh, that you that there that is appropriate to add at this point in time. If not, that's fine too. I'll turn to thank you, Andrew. Chair. Um, I just forwarded an email um, to the House Health Care Committee, and um, I will take advice about the best way to 
um, I can create a document instead of an email that that perhaps we could upload to our committee website so others can see it. Um, but we did uh, meet once um, and have uh, some email communication before that um, and came up with a, a fairly comprehensive list of things that um, we would want to be sure were addressed. Um, the plan was that um, as far as moving forward formally with this list, we um, it would be better to wait till H-439, um, the appropriations bill um, has been signed into law. But just to touch on some of the issues were, um, one, just a, a correction, actually, the first bullet talks about grappling with substance abuse disorder. It should be substance use disorder. Um, also in making sure that um, the funding silos between housing and services, um, that the silos are removed, that there's a, a direct connection between um, housing and the services that um, go with them. And that, that was something that our um, communities brought up as a, uh, and our community providers and housing providers um, brought up as a, as a major issue. Um, and then might the 1115 waiver negotiations consider investments um, related to the provision of shelter um, and a lot more. So I'll, I'll let you look at the, the list in the email I sent you. And um, Chair, do you think that would be acceptable for me to create a PDF of the bullet list? Yeah, and I wanna, let, let's, check in, let's check in offline when we get a chance. Um, okay. Before, before we take too much further, just be clear. Okay. We're doing what is consistent with the Appropriations Committee's uh, next steps. Sounds good. Uh, Representative Burroughs, is there anything that? Uh... Well, just to just to take a step back, what this was was uh, a there's a work a work group that right. is tasked with coming up with a plan for what to do with people who are the 1,900 people who are housed in hotels, and we were committee members who were um, assigned to discuss from the committee perspective um, uh, what from, from our, each from our own um, uh, subject area perspective, what uh, brings suggestions to what the plan should actually wind up being. So uh, yeah. And this was a follow-up to the joint testimony with the Human Services Committee. That's right. That That's right. And I think one one thing that uh, is listed in the list that I want to highlight is um, that we did talk specifically about using the pathways model um, uh -huh. as one of the ways to to provide wraparound services. Great. Good. Okay. Um, Representative Goldman. Yeah, I just have a question. I'm not sure if the committee thinks thinking about this and I just need help understanding it. From my understanding, a lot of times shelters are only open at night, like people can come for dinner and sleep and then they have to leave um, and don't have, don't have a place to be during the day. So is that still an issue? I know that's the way it was in my area. And I always felt terrible about that because what if you don't have a place to go during the day? That sounds horrible. So. I'm just wondering if the committee is thinking about that um, particular issue when they think about shelters. I, I don't, it did not come up. So I don't recall it. I've just, just been glancing through my notes about it and, and I don't recall it coming up uh, during the discussion we had on Monday. Can I suggest that uh, you engage further with uh, Representative Cordes and Representative Burroughs? Uh, offline as well. And uh, this, there, I don't believe this is the last opportunity for some yeah. input along these. And, and I think the pathways model is also uh, one of the ways to respond to some of those issues as well, which of course our committee has been supportive of and uh, as, as one of the models to, to pursue. So, so again, thank you Representative Curtis, Curtis Representative Burroughs for representing our committee on that. 
So with that, let's uh, let's conclude for the morning and uh, we'll see you on the floor and stay in touch. Uh, please do stay in touch in terms of texts or emails from Colleen as we uh, have the need to reconvene uh, to address issues along the way. Uh, and I, I will try to stay in touch actively throughout this process. So thank you. And I, I guess I just lastly want to say uh, how, how much I appreciate the initiative that this committee took and has is continuing to take around children and the emergency service and the wait, wait times in emergency rooms. Uh, that is, is an example of initiative that uh, came from particular areas, but that then was taken a hold of by this committee in a really uh, significant way. And I think is, a, as, is an important piece of the work of our committee in this half of the biennium. Uh, so let's, let's keep that. This, it, there's no bill number to say, yes, we passed bill so-and-so, but that's uh, there are times when some of the most important work we do, not to demean our, the bills we pass, but uh, end up being something that's reflected in an appropriation we advocated for in the budget or in uh, work that we're doing that's ongoing in collaborative relationships uh, or the letter that I think actually achieved uh, some significant uh, impact here, at least from my point of view at this point. So. Okay, it's the sun is shining where I am. I hope it's shining where you are. Uh, let's all get a break, go outside, get something uh, good for uh, our, the sunshine is always good for my mental health. <laughs>